Alrighty, folks. So, um, today we're we're moving on onwards and upwards, and um, we're starting a little bit of a an introduction chapter. For some of you, it might be some re review. Um, for some of you, it may be the first time you're hearing some of it, bits and pieces. It's a mixed. It's a mixed bag. Uh, this was uh, put together over over the years, really, um, for a handful of reasons. Things that we somehow managed to get to the uh, end of the semester, or nearly so, and I realized we didn't talk about yet because it didn't necessarily fit into any of the other PowerPoints. Um, stuff that I assumed that everybody knew, et cetera, et cetera. And then, you know, tangentially re related material. Well, I can't tell you this if I don't mention that kind of thing. And um, in the end, it really serves as a good sort of coverall, um, a prep for the rest of the semester. So... Not necessarily, and here, here's where, here's why I'm giving you this disclaimer. This isn't a chapter in your book. There's bits and pieces out of a handful of, of chapters in here. And um, so again, for you chapter readers out there, you know, thinking, oh, finally I could sit down and read chapter two and we're going to talk about it today. We're not quite there yet. We will be soon. We'll be soon. So, what have you been staring at the, the whole time I've been talking to you here I, on the screen, not on, not on your little screens in front of you, the big screen in the front of the room? What is this a picture of? The Earth. Excellent. Excellent. And um, what are the chances this is a, a real picture? We've got unlikely. we got a what? Pretty slim. Because what? All right. Well, that that's a that's a good reason. Um, he made me nervous there for a minute. <laughs> it is a real picture. It is a real picture. But my 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 point is that um, when I was sitting in your seats, or probably a few years before that, even uh, at least your grandparents. All right. A picture like this, not necessarily that possible. Yeah, we'd been to the moon, obviously, late 60s. Um, but photography, whatever kind of imaging you want to talk it wasn't really that good yet. Um, you're going to see if, uh, actually, we won't do hurricanes this semester, but some of the radar images um, that I show when we talk about hurricanes that are from, like, some of the big classic hurricanes of, of, of you know, late 90s, early 2000s, and it looks like 8-bit Atari stuff uh, compared to, you know, what you guys see nowadays. Cameras have really come a long way. So, yeah, uh, I'm pretty sure, at any rate, this is a real picture. If not, I've definitely seen real pictures that, that look very similar to this. Um, so, yeah, we have that technology now. Um, what If you had to base it, you know, just from this picture alone... What color's the earth? Blue. Mostly blue. All right. Um, we are covered nearly three quarters of this planet, um, nearly, in ocean. It seems, being continental dwellers like we are, that, you know, oh my gosh, there's so much land. Um, but the oceans are way, way, way bigger. This is a image that you're probably very used to seeing, uh, this perspective. And I would like somehow one of these days to be able to get some introductory earth science textbooks, geology textbooks, whatever, from over in Asia or even Europe. And look 
because I always call this North Americano-centric. Because every image of the globe they show us, it's always pointing on North America and a little bit of South America. But uh, I'd like to think that, uh, you know, if you live other places in the world, they show you a different view. Not everybody has to stare at North America, right? This is a good example, though, because it does illustrate our point about how much oceans there are. Europe and Asia, as I'm sure you remember, are quite a huge landmass. So if we focused maybe the, the, the camera on that area and then with Africa underneath it, that's going to take up most of that circle, right? So maybe it was done purposefully, but I always like to joke a little bit that these are very sort of biased global views we get. All right, so there's a whole lot of blue. What else do we see? What other colors are in there? <coughs> okay, okay. Now, there is color enhancing. There's all, you know, they, they do that a lot um, to accentuate, just kind of like you guys might hit fix on one of the photos you take. Okay. Um, we, we do that, too. Their scientists can do that, too. Um, especially when you're looking at space stuff, all right? There's a whole lot of ways we can look at space. There's, um, if you guys, I don't know the last time you had wavelengths, but you know there's, there's radio waves, there's X-ray X -ray waves, there's visible light, there's all, all these different spectrums. And a lot of the times um, they will stack images in order to get something that we appreciate because we like color. We're, we grow up in a world of visible colors. Um, so a lot of times they will uh, either color enhance um, something or they'll stack. Like that's kind of the cool thing about Hubble Telescope and some of the other ones we have. They look at the visual spectrum. Um, but black holes and stuff like that, they're on the X-ray spectrum. So if you want to look at a black hole, you know, you're going to see an X-ray image, but uh, they will maybe stack, you know, some another couple images on top of that to give it some some depth, some perspective, so to speak. So anywho, so we got the blue. So he mentioned the orangish brownish stuff. What do you guys think that is? Color enhanced or otherwise, what is it supposed to be? Yeah, yeah that's the, de well, deserts are just land. Uh, could be mountains, could be a lot of things, but it's not what's the green stuff. Vegetation. Right, we'll, we'll, we'll generalize here. We'll keep it. They could be jungles. They could be forests. They could be a whole bunch of things. But we're just going to say, you know, highly vegetated. <coughs> so, um, so we have some areas of the earth that are highly vegetated. We have some areas of the earth not so much. And those are, you know, the land, what we call the land of the continents, so on and so forth. So, um, so that covers the land masses. Uh, what's the last thing on there? What's all that white stuff? Clouds or our atmosphere, okay? Now, one of the things that your your high school science has pushed a lot that I don't talk about so much um, are all those o-spheres. Remember the o-spheres? The hydrosphere, the, the, well, atmosphere we do talk about, the geosphere, the this sphere, the, the all these spheres, all right? We don't really use those terms too much. But think about that stuff in regards to, to what I'm talking about, okay? We're just not using the vocabulary words for it. All right, so we've got a nice picture of the Earth here, literally and now figuratively. We've got a planet that is uh, apparently mostly water. It's got some land on it. Uh, that land has vegetation. Uh, that land has some areas that's not so vegetated. And they appear to have an atmosphere with what we're going to call clouds in it, all right? And a big blue marble, you may have heard that before. Uh, it really does kind of look like that. Well, let's back up a little further. And uh, like she said earlier, you know, you're, uh, we get sort of a cropped view there, right? If we were really looking at that Earth, we would see it being surrounded by, of course, space, right? And depending on what direction you're looking, you might catch the moon in there. And we'll actually talk a little bit about the moon. <coughs> but around all of that, 
you've got basically empty black space. All right. And uh, you've looked from here upwards, hopefully. We don't have a lot of them, but we do have some clear nights here in New upper New York State. Well, there's also some stuff out there that you can't see. All right. I want to talk about that stuff for a couple minutes. We're very, very lucky that it's there. Without the magnetosphere and the Van Allen belts, uh, I don't even want to say life would be different. Life probably would not even be here. All right. Um, the magnetosphere you've probably heard about. You want to call it the Nidos magnetosphere. That's fine by me. I often do. Uh, you'll see a slide about this. Uh, actually, the next slide, I think. Uh, the magnetosphere is actually generated by the Earth. It's sort of a force field, if you would, to borrow some sci-fi talk for a little bit. And it provides us uh, protection from something called solar winds. The sun is a star. You guys know that, right? All right. Well, some people forget. Um, we see all these other stars, and it looks so different. Why does it look so different than all the other stars? Yeah, it's, it's way closer. Way closer. Does anyone remember how far away the sun is or how close the sun is? 100s of miles, thousands of miles. Millions, okay, good, millions, what? Nine, 93, you had the nine right. 93 million, 93 million miles. I forget if it's eight minutes or nine minutes. Uh, I want to say it's on the nine minute mark. It takes a, a, we'll call it a particle of sunlight, right? Um, nine minutes to travel here. That's how far away it is at the speed of light, right? Because it, it's light. Um, you guys did your first, uh, the first lab, I'm sure. One of the questions on there talked about the speed of light. You know, it's, you might not remember the number, but it's pretty freaking fast, isn't it? All right. Um, so being able to travel that fast, it still takes nine minutes for a, 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 a sunbeam to make it here. But here's the deal. The uh, next closest star, again, you'll see this a little later, is, is coming up on four light years. All right. Um, that's a big, big difference. I'm not going to start throwing numbers at you, but you'll see in a little bit. So all those other stars, the closest of them is, is just way so much farther away. So they look a lot smaller. All right. So anywho, um, so the solar winds, the sun is close enough that uh, its radiation, as many of you know, uh, can, can be quite harmful to us. And I'm not just talking about sunburn, all right? And I'm not just talking about UV rays, this, you know, skin cancer kind of stuff. Uh, there's way worse stuff that it's given off. And that is trapped in our atmosphere. So the magnetosphere is part of that. And then we've got these Van Allen radiation belts. Um, those are a, uh, an area, again, up in that magnetosphere area that... Uh, allows, or that captures, I should say, um, some even nastier stuff. Now, this is good and bad. It's great for the planet. It's great for humankind and critter kind and all that stuff. But this is also the reason why when we go out into space, we've got to worry about so much radiation because we're actually, you know, we've, we, we've got these fields out there and um, we sometimes have to travel through them get close to them, so on and so forth, let alone once you get past them, well, then you've got to figure out how to absorb all that stuff from your, your space travelers. So uh, radiation is a big issue up in space um, that they're working on. They're working on solving. So we've got our built-in force shields, all right? Um, so the magnetosphere, a little more about it. It's protective shield. It's created by the core of the Earth. <clears throat> As you recall, the core of the Earth is split into two parts. Um, you've got a molten outer core and a solid inner core. And they're both made of metal. We don't need to worry about what kind of metal right yet. We'll have some slides about that later. 
But the fact that one is rotating around the other, all right, sloshing around it, uh, I, I think more than likely because the Earth is rotating, of course, so it gets that molten stuff moving, uh, that creates an energized energy field. It's polarized, which means it has a positive and a negative. And that's why compasses, right? Um, so it's north, north pole, south pole. So all that is a function of the magnetosphere. And why, coincidentally, conveniently, whatever, um, we've got these cool things called compasses that, that we can use. Or why we were able to make compasses. So this is not a giant purple space squid, even though that would be kind of cool. Um, what we're looking at is an artist. Now, this is not a real picture. This is probably somebody's graduate thesis. Um, we've got in the center of said space squid there a tiny little marble. That there's the Earth. And where it's sort of like coming in at the top and the bottom, sort of pinching together. All right. Those are your two poles. And, and what they're showing you is, is how much effect the sun's energy is actually really having, uh, on, um, on that, that energy field. So those things that look like the tentacles draggling out there, that's sort of like, you know, the vapor trails going behind it. The energy is swooshing it back. Like if you had a streamers on your car and you're driving down the road, it's, it's, it's doing that. It's so strong that it's doing that. In front, it's a nice big buffer sort of shield, sort of rounded out again due to the, um, you know, the force of the energy. But, uh, but behind it, I guess, they and again, these are just studies. This is research. It's, it's not 1,000% accurate. Remember, we talked about the scientific method on day one. But this is what they think. And nowadays, hell, I'm sure we've got satellites that could look at, you know, this kind of information whether this was hypothesized at some point um, or whether this data, and I, and I, I should know, I suppose, was actually uh, based on some satellite data. Again, we could look at darn near every spectrum that exists. But this may have been an idea that was later proved, or it might still be somebody's thoughts. So if you look at that and you see, holy cow, all that magnetic energy, you know, strong enough that it can make my compass all the way down here in Utica point up to the North Pole, that's a that's pretty big energy field, all right? Um, the sun is definitely warping the hell out of it, right? So pretty powerful stuff. Thank goodness it is here. So the Van Allen belt, as I mentioned a couple minutes ago, it's an area within the magnetosphere, and um, it's just... When I first started explaining this, I didn't quite get what it what, what they were. Um, it's not another layer. It's a layer within. Okay. And um, it's a particular, I, I don't know if it's due to the strength of the magnetism at that particular point or why this stuff focuses there. But basically, um, you could almost think of it as the first line of defense or maybe a middle barrier. You know, you're playing chess and you got all those pawns out in the front row and they pick off, you know, as much of the sun's energy as they can and then, boom, there's a second line of defense. Maybe that's how it is. But so, and we've got a picture on the next slide here. So many of you are trying to frantically write this down. Remember, guys, you have access to these slides uh, on power on the, on the D2L site, okay? The PowerPoints are up there for you. Um, please utilize them. And you don't have to... Give yourself carpal tunnel taking notes in here. You can just write down some cool anecdotal stuff. So this is up there again. It gets in our way, but it's a, you know, we've got to deal with that because it's way better than it coming through. And as I mentioned earlier, all right, if this hadn't formed, um, more than likely, uh, you know, if, if life had was able to evolve under those conditions, it probably would have gone quite differently. Um, radiation, uh, you guys know it causes cancer, but at its most basic level, a cancer is a mutation, right? It's mutated cells of some sort or another. 
And, and believe it or not, we look for those mutations uh, early on when we're trying to get life rolling, all right? Uh, if you wonder how, you know, this weirdness happened or that weirdness happened, well, mutations. And the sun's energy is, you know, one of the ways that the, that, that could have happened. Uh, one of the other layers that you guys know about, probably a lot more than this one, the ozone layer, right? That wasn't always there. It had to build. And... Um, it wasn't able to build until a certain point of time, and life had actually started to kick in by then a little bit. Um, so a lot of people hold that, you know, once the ozone layer kicked in and started filtering out a lot of the UV rays, well, it cut down on the mutations, and things sort of stabilized, if you would. So I, I don't want you to know a whole hell of a lot about the, the Van Allen belts. I, I'm not going to ask you to label diagrams or anything, but I just I want you to be aware that they're out there uh, as a function of the magnetosphere and uh, which is a function of the earth it's self rotating and because of that all this is possible so speaking of the atmosphere this is one of the things that I knew a lot of people didn't know and I'm not even sure what point in time I became aware of it um, we hear all the time about oxygen, 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 oxygen. So dang important. We need oxygen. Yes, we do need oxygen. But it is not the primary component of the atmosphere. All right? You see, by far, nitrogen is our number one ingredient. Number one ingredient. 78% of what you just inhaled a second ago was nitrogen. And, and the weird thing is, nitrogen's important. All right, don't get me wrong, but it, it, it more or less just sort of passes through us. It's, it's almost, dare I say, like filler. Because um, you do rely on that 21% oxygen quite a bit. If it goes down to 20 or, or 19, you, your body realizes it pretty, pretty darn quickly. If it goes up, you even notice that. Now, too much nitrogen can be a problem. There's not a whole lot of folks out there who uh, dive, but uh, you've probably heard of the bends, right? And um, that's when the nitrogen builds up in your blood. Not good. So too much nitrogen can be a problem. Something that I try to stress, and it, it, it usually doesn't come out until we get to the uh, more a little more into the components of the atmosphere when it, we, you, you, you see about CO2. And it's such a small number, the percentage of CO2. And you guys are like, really? I, as much as you know, they're going on about all the carbon dioxide, it's, it's that percent? And so the point is, is isn't that it's 21% oxygen or 78% or nitrogen, but it, the point is, is that that's what the Earth sort of set itself to. All right, I'm an I'm an Earth system scientist. I, I believe that uh, I guess it's a philosophy sort of thing. Um, the Earth does try to maintain itself. It's a system. It's an operating system, and all these different components. We're one of those components. The forests are another, the deserts, the oceans, everything is components. To go back to those O-spheres that you learned in high school. So it isn't necessarily whether the oxygen is 21%. It's that the Earth set it at 21%, and we've managed to do all this at that percentage. So when you hear that things are changing and you're like, oh my God, it's such a small number, who... Who cares? Well, everything is because of that number. So when you mess with it, it is going to affect other things. And that's something we're used to thinking, you know, oh, it's just a little gum wrapper. It doesn't matter if I throw it out the window. All right? A lot of people use that, that logic. Oh, it's just one quart of oil. I could dump it down the drain. It won't matter. But when we apply that to this kind of thinking, um, you miss the point that it is what Mother Nature set it at. So, anywho, I'm getting off on a tangent. I apologize. 
So 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen. Uh, you realize that that's not quite 100%. There is some other stuff out there. Um, our atmosphere is held to Earth by uh, its gravity. All right. Now, again, first lab. You may have wondered why I didn't go over it the next day in lab. We, we talk about it all semester long. We talk about those, those questions. Gravity is a function of mass, right? The more mass you have, the more you're affected by gravity. So these air molecules, again, you can't see them. You can feel it if you move your hand around a little bit. For those of you at home, I'm waving my hand around. All right, you feel that little breeze. Feel free to do it yourselves. All right, that's all those air molecules. You guys want to do it. Go ahead, just don't whack your neighbor. All right, that's those air molecules. They're there. They're tiny, but they have mass. And since they have mass, they are affected by gravity. And the Earth is so big that it has a decent amount of gravity. All right? So we manage to keep this, these gases at the Earth's surface. As you can imagine, just like a bonfire or many other things, it's much stronger closest to it, right? You go to a bonfire, it gets warmer, 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 till you get right there and it's the hottest. Music, the closer you get to the speakers, the louder it gets, so on and so forth. So just like that, gravity works the same way. And it is closest, it is strongest closest to the Earth. So we see this atmosphere really, really dense right around the Earth itself. But as you go further out, it starts to thin out. And again, we'll show you some stuff that, that supports and or explains that. I already mentioned the ozone layer. That should be one of your favorite layers in the atmosphere. It does you a very um, good amount of uh, protection. And ozone layer stands as probably, I don't want to say the first and only time that, that the Earth worked, all the people on the planet worked together to fix a problem, but one of the few times... There was a big issue back in the 80s, the ozone hole, right? Hole in the ozone layer. And um, we got together globally and actually banned a lot of chemicals that were apparently causing the problem because once we stopped using them in all the first world countries, um, the hole sort of closed up. Again, her system, she's a lot bigger than us. She will do, you know, things go up, things go down in the Earth's history. But it would have been a hell of a coincidence if, if it just decided to close up and we quit using certain chemicals all at the same time. So it does look like it was a direct result. Now, there are still some holes here and there. But the big, big, big gaping one, okay, we did manage to mostly close. And again, we care about that because the ozone layer uh, is a huge ultraviolet filter. And ultraviolet radiation, we don't like so much. So throwing a few more atmosphere words at you here, you see stratosphere and troposphere. All right, stratosphere is the next layer above us. Troposphere is where we live. And the stratosphere is the layer just above us. That's where the ozone lives. Okay. So the troposphere is the area that we operate in. <coughs> Again, you'll see a diagram in a moment or two. Stratosphere just above that. So I mentioned this a moment ago. I didn't use these words because sciencey words tend to make you guys nervous. Pressure and density, air pressure and air density. Remember, we all talked about just a moment ago the uh, how the gravity is strong as closest to the Earth, and therefore the atmosphere is concentrated there. And you all nodded along with me because that made sense. All right. Well, that's all this is saying. Both air pressure and air density decrease as you leave the surface. The air is most dense at the surface. So as you go upwards, let's say you're taking off in a plane, all right? As you go upwards through that, um, 
the air density becomes lower and lower and lower. And you already probably know, you go up climbing a mountain, you might have trouble breathing. Go up to Denver, Colorado, mile high up. You see these folks that are out there climbing Mount Everest, and they've got the oxygen masks, and so on and so forth. Air's a lot thinner. Air pressure is a function of that. All right, I'm not going to whip out the formula. Well, the formulas are right there. I say I'm not going to whip out the formulas, but they're right there, so you could look at them. Think of air pressure as weight. Again, these are teeny tiny molecules, but they do have mass, and since there is gravity involved, they do have weight. Weight is what you feel that ma the, the pressure from the mass pushing down on you. So again, it should only make sense that uh, at the surface, you have the most amount of air molecules above you, so air pressure would be the strongest or the highest, however you want to say it. And as you go up that super high mountain in Colorado or wherever you are, you literally have less air molecules above you, therefore you have less pressure pushing down on you, right? So again, pressure is force per area. And if you forgot what force is, force is mass times acceleration. I think that's lowercase a. And the acceleration in this case is gravity. If you're like me, you merely believe in physics. You trust physics. So, um, if these formulas are scaring you, again, don't worry. We're not going to use them to calculate anything. But minds who are much more tuned into stuff like this uh, than mine and, and some of yours maybe worked it out. And this is how it works. These I, I actually do understand. Back when I was sitting in your seats, eh, it made more sense to me than chemistry did. But... Uh, and density, mass, mass over volume, that's, you know, that's, that's an easy one. We'll talk about that later in the semester a little bit. But. So air pressure, air density. The idea, again, is that they both decrease as you leave the surface of the Earth. All right. So here's that diagram that I promised you. Again, don't worry too much about the numbers. Uh, we do have a, a picture of Mount Everest here for, for reference. Like, that's a great reference for anybody. Other than we know that it's really, really high, right? Um, we've also got an airplane. To show you where, presumably, airplanes typically fly. Uh, luckily, higher than Mount Everest, should you be going that direction, it's a good thing. I think the really only the real point on here is to show you that again this goes back to the density part is that before you were to reach the uh, top of Mount Everest you would be above uh, you'd be losing 50% of the, the density of the atmosphere 50% of the nitrogen and the oxygen and all that other fun stuff that we have down there all right point being it thins out pretty dang quick going to be another running theme in here. I know not everyone is as mobile as the Joppo family is, and there are certainly families more mobile than us, but I just put a good 600 miles on my car over the weekend. Drove out to JFK, pucked around, and drove back. Heck, even going to Syracuse. You didn't go there to shop or to watch a basketball game or whatever. You're going farther horizontally than you can go in any other direction. And we're used to that. We don't think about that. We're really kind of limited, 
on this planet. You go up 45 miles, things change very drastically, very quickly. Not to mention, you, you, you know, you can't use your just car to do that. You need a special vehicle, right? And again, that's not a huge problem because if you know if we wanted to do that, we could do that. We'd have those. Be they'd be more prevalent. Those hover cars they promised us, right? Um, go down. Well, that's that's solid rock. How are we going to do that? Well, there's there's ways. But again, even if we could do that, we've got pressure to deal with. We've got heat to deal with. So going up or down on this planet is really dang tough. So enjoy going about horizontally, okay? Because that's pretty much all most of us get. And some of you might go on and become pilots, astronauts. You get to do that whole vertical thing. But most of us, we stay on the ground. I think that's part of why, if you've ever climbed up a mountain and you got up to the top and you look around, I think that's why that's so fascinating to us. All right, it's because we get to see this this view that we don't normally get. Usually anywhere we turn, we've got trees, buildings, and you can't see past that. So it's just something really neat to our brains about getting up above all of it. It's like it's not somewhere we're supposed to be, you know? A little bit more about air pressure. As I said, this is a tangible thing. We've measured it. 14.7 pounds per square inch. And that's probably the only time this semester I'll get it right because I'm staring at it here. I know it's right around 14, but I always forget the exact number. A one inch square and as high as the atmosphere. That's kind of hard to picture. So what I ask you guys to sort of mentally bring into to, to state right now is... Uh, Remember that little box that has all the, the pins in it or nails in it and uh, you sort of you press on it with your hand and it leaves that impression in your hand and usually when you walk by them it's just somebody's middle finger sticking up that, that thing, okay? So, but hang that down like it's a car wash. And those are the little rags hanging from a car wash. All right. Anywho, <clears throat> if you were to walk through that, bring your hand through that and those little pins go up and down as you're walking, pushing your hand through it. That's sort of you going through those 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 one inch columns of air, all right. Not that you're pushing the air up, but just kind of get my idea, all right. That's that per square inch kind of thing, and you don't notice the fact that you've got fourteen point seven pounds of square inch pushing on you all the time. Uh, it's on your phone, it's on your coffee, it's on your laptop, it's on everything because it's always been there. You've always been under fourteen point seven pounds of of pressure. Again, that's why we notice it. Heck, how many of you, if you go up a high mountain or come down a high mountain, your ears start popping? Okay? That is your body attempting to adjust to the different pressure. You take an airplane ride. All right? Again, that's a way different than coming down a hill. They pressurize the cabins, so on and so forth. We need to adjust to that. We're used to 14.7 pounds. And it makes sense if you stop and think about it. Nobody ever does. You've got 14.7 pounds of pressure pushing outwards on your body. Keeps you together. You've heard, okay, you can't get down to the bottom of the ocean. You'll get crushed, right? You'll get crushed because, well, the weight of all that water, so on and so forth. So you've got to, inside your little submarine or whatever you're going to do, you've got to put equal pressure to keep that thing from compacting down into a sardine can. Well, again, we know that. And the people that are smart enough to go down in those little submarines, lucky enough to go down in those little submarines, they certainly know that. But you know what happened? When we first got down to the really, 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 real far down parts, Marianas Trench, you may have heard of it, and we found critters down there, right? They were so excited that they found critters and they were able to finally get samples and so on and so forth. So they bring these dudes up to the surface. They're not dudes, they're little guys. But they bring these little guys up to the surface. Guess what? They've got such a huge internal pressure 
so mm -hmm. they don't collapse down underneath the bottom of the ocean. Then when they came up to sea level, pop, 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 pop. So they can't even exist up here because their internal pressure is so so high. And again, these folks were super smart. They know this stuff, but you know, you know, you don't think to to apply it. So we aren't supposed to be down there. They aren't supposed to be up here. And the same thing happens if you go the other direction. All right? So you're used to 14.7 pounds of pressure. That's what you've always been exposed to. That's what you quite probably will always be exposed to. It doesn't really affect your life unless you pay attention to the weather. All right? The barometer. That's how we measure air pressure. You might have heard the weather person say, you know, the pressure is this and rising, or we have a low pressure front or a high pressure front coming through. 14.7 pounds per square inch translates into 29.92 inches of mercury. It's a bizarre little contraption. I don't have a picture of it in this slideshow. But basically just picture a, a tube bent into a, a U, all right? And it's got mercury in it. Again, why mercury? Well, we probably made it before we knew how bad mercury was. But um, I'm sure there's an alcohol version of it nowadays. But traditionally, it's mercury. And the air presses down on one side of the tube, and it raises that mercury up the other side of the tube to, <clears throat> it's calibrated like a little ruler, 29.92 inches. That's standard atmosphere. That's sea level, so to speak. You bring that same barometer up to a really, really high mountain, there's less air inside of it. That mercury doesn't go up the other side as much. So maybe it goes down to 29.75. It doesn't, it's not huge changes. I've been paying attention for a long time, and I don't think I've ever seen anything lower than like a 28 and higher than a 30. I've not ever Googled it, just sort of anecdotally noticing over the years. But that's the difference with cold fronts, warm fronts. And again, this isn't a weather class. And earth science folks, um, you will, talking to the computer here for a moment, folks at home, uh, we will talk about that a little bit when we get to the meteorology chapter. But in, in geology here, we don't, we don't talk about that too much. Weather, at any rate. So that's what's going on in the air. All right, this is a, at first glance, a big scary looking diagram. Don't let it do that to you, though. There's a, too much in this diagram. It's part of the problem. What we want to use this for is a uh, sort of a graphic organizer of our layers of the atmosphere. Down at the very bottom, you see that mountain for reference again. That is the troposphere, where we live. Above us, you see the stratosphere. Then there's the mesosphere. Meso meaning middle. And then above that you have the thermosphere. Now, it's not on here, but many of you are familiar with something called the exosphere. All right? Exosphere is what we typically call space. Um, thermosphere and exosphere. I would say they're synonymous, but they certainly are used um, interchangeably by a lot of people. So thermosphere is going to be our blending into space layer on, on this diagram. The troposphere, stratosphere, methosphere, thermosphere. All right. Come up with some sort of mnemonic or something to remember TSMP. If you think you'll have trouble remembering that. Don't worry about the homo and hetero over there on the side. We don't care about that. What we do care about, though, is that red line. That red line represents temperature. And you see probably what you expect to see with the thermos or the troposphere there. All right, that the higher you go, the lower it gets. When I was growing up, um, those bomber jackets were really popular. You know, sort of the leather jackets with the big woolly collars and, and the lining and all that stuff. Um, I wasn't anywhere near World War II time-wise, but we were a lot closer to it, all right? 
and a lot of those old guys are still around and so on and so forth. There's, there's a lot more TV and movie shows oriented around it. It's a popular thing. Well, there's a reason that those guys had to wear those jackets. It was really cold up there. Really cold. Airplanes aren't horribly insulated, at least what they were flying in. Those cockpits and everything, if you want a fighter pilot, and let alone, you call them bomber jackets, but they, you know, they all wore them. So it was really cold. So they had to wear those. And there's all those urban legends about people, you know, stowing away in luggage compartments and this, that, and the other thing. You, you just, you know it's cold up there. You don't know why you know that, but that's something you just know. All right, and this, this, this illustrates that well. Um, it moves, so it's a move to the left, by the way, is a decrease in temperature. A move to the right is an increase in temperature. So standard, um, standard uh, surface temperature is right there, right about at 60 Fahrenheit ish. All right, I think it's actually like 58 point something is the average, but it, it looks right around where it's lining up with 60. And uh, by the time you get up to the top, I'm looking at it from an angle, but we're right around. Uh, Somewhere between minus 80 and minus 40, so we'll call that minus uh, 60. All right. Um, again, you don't need to remember that. I'm just, just trying to show you how much it changes. So once you hit the stratosphere, it levels out. Right? That line, that red line goes straight, levels out for a while, and it actually, if you go up high enough in the stratosphere, it starts to increase. And it goes back to almost the, the average surface temperature. Then we hit the mesosphere, and boy, it really drops. And then in the thermosphere, it looks like it starts to increase again, and then the chart just ends. Well, I'm going to tell you that if we had more chart on there, it would just keep going up and up and up. <coughs> yes, I'm sure there is an upper limit. Don't know what it is. But the fact is, is that it gets really, really, really hot up there. And I know you're thinking to yourself, wait a minute, Proctor, you're just, uh, you're just telling me uh, with that space, and I've always heard about the cold, hard vacuum of, of space, right? It's cold out in space. And all those Hollywood movies when somebody's visor cracks and they freeze. I just saw that in Guardians of the Galaxy. It's got to be real, right? Um, what's going on? How could it be hot? Anyone want to hazard a guess on that one? The sun? All right, what's the sun? Oh, because you're getting closer to the sun? Yeah. Yeah? All right, well, yeah. We're, how far away is the sun? 93 million miles, and you're at like 100 miles. That might be a little warmer. Definitely getting more radiation because you're up above, you know, a couple of the barriers, but not quite. Anybody else? Yeah. Okay. It could it could be again. So you're you're still tying it to the sun a little bit. Yeah. All right, so still sun related. I thought at first you were going to say we're used to the warmth of the earth because the earth does radiate. That's, that's how it's still because You change your mind halfway through. Okay, I would have stuck with your first one. Still wrong, but it's it's a neat idea. So we're used to the earth sort of like a radiator keeping us warm. All right, and so we don't have that out there. But no, still not it. All right, one more guess, anybody? <laughs> Excellent question. So how could it be so damn hot out there and also cold enough to freeze you? Bingo. Bingo. Remember what we just, the whole point of the last 15 minutes, right, is air density. That's what we've been talking about. But there's one missing key factor that he may or may not know. And somebody, once I say it, you be like, oh, yeah, yeah, I knew that. What is temperature actually? Well, yeah, but now see, you just lost points. <laughs> uh, what is temperature a measure of? Let's word it that way. How much fast what's moving? Molecule. Temperature is a measure of molecular speed. All right? 
at its most, and I did not know this for years. I must have been doodling because absolute zero made no sense to me. I thought absolute zero was so dang cold that even molecules couldn't move. I thought they like froze, right? I must have been doodling or something when the teacher was explaining it. And I, I literally thought that until I started teaching. Well, absolute zero is really, really cold because and it's so cold that even molecules can't move. No, it's the other way around. Temperature is a measure of molecular movement. So if you have molecules not moving, then you're at, what's it, minus 273K, right? That's your absolute zero. So, so the point is, is that temperature is a measure of molecular speed. And how's it, what's the relationship there, fast versus slow? What's slow molecular speed? Is that hot or cold? Cold. So fast is, is hot, all right? So this is starting to come together now. The problem is that there's so few air molecules out there that you are, temperature has to be perceived. Temperature is, is a phenomena that you literally have to experience, all right? Um, so if you were to touch an air molecule out there, you would feel that it is very, very, very hot. But because there are so few air molecules out there, the perception is that it is quite cold indeed, all right? And um, so they can actually both be true. All right, good. A little bit of interaction will fuel you up. It's good. Good, good, good. So while both atmospheric pressure and density decrease as we leave the surface of the Earth, temperature vacillates wildly, right? Temperature changes. Lapse rate. Lapse rate is a word specifically uh, for the troposphere, and it tells us not only does temperature decrease as you go upwards through the troposphere, but it decreases at a more or less constant rate of what? 3.6 degrees for every thousand feet. Another homework question. How many feet were in a mile, roughly? 5280. I don't remember a whole lot of constants in life, but for some reason I, I've known that one for almost ever. I don't know why. 5,280 feet. So we'll just say 5,000 to make math simple. <clears throat> so for every mile that you go up, well, 5 times 3 is, is 15, and 5 times 0.6, uh, we'll cut that down to maybe 7-ish. So uh, for every mile you go up, temperature drops a little over 20 degrees, arguably, in the troposphere. Remember, this is only explaining that first decline in that red line that we saw. And it's so constant, so predictable, that they made a word for it. The word is lapse rate. So those guys, again, that are up there in those planes, and gals, all right, um, but back then it was guys flying. Um, if you're up a couple miles... All right, you're losing 25-ish degrees, whatever we just said a couple minutes ago, for every mile. It's cold up there. They wear them jackets and the big floppy ear hats. Remember, those, big, those are still popular. Look silly as heck in them, but they are quite warm, I have to agree. Um, so there's a reason they had to dress like that. Okay, again, I'm not horribly interested in these you memorizing these numbers, with a couple exceptions. You got about seven miles of air, as we know and love it, the troposphere. That's worth remembering. Because again, remember what I was talking about, driving out to Queens or wherever the hell I was this weekend at JFK and back, or you driving to Syracuse and back. One of these days I'm going to have uh, maps make a, a circle around Utica that shows seven miles. Many of you drove more than seven miles this morning. You do that upwards, you're out of air. You need special equipment. Heck, you're having problems before you even get that far. So, I'm not trying to give you claustrophobia or anything. I'm just trying to, you know, get, get across that idea that, that we are surface dwellers. Okay? So, after that approximate, that little tip, uh, squiggly there, it's called the tilde. All right? That means approximately. I use it a lot. Geologists are not engineers. 
Engineers are very specific. Geologists love to round. We love to say approximately. And I think it's because we deal with such huge chunks of time and, and stuff like that. But anywho, so that's approximately seven is what that little squiggly means. So the stratosphere kicks in after that, of course. <coughs> Goes up to about 30 miles. The mesosphere up to about 50 miles. The thermosphere, 55 to 300. And then this one has the exosphere labeled. 300 to Lord knows how far. I want you to also know where space kicks in. All right. Space, we're going to put it 300 miles. Again, really need special equipment to do that. So troposphere, you want to remember, and exosphere, space, space, you want to remember. Don't start packing up yet. I need one more slide, okay? And it's actually going to switch gears topic-wise, so this is perfect. I got four more minutes. I need, like, two of them. So, we mentioned nitrogen and oxygen already. As our current atmospheric conditions, as you're going to learn throughout the semester, this hasn't always been. As you've heard me mention already, things do change. CO2 levels in the atmosphere come and go with ice ages and lack thereof. We didn't always have free oxygen in the atmosphere. Things were quite different when the Earth first started forming. Things will be different 100,000 years from now. So, anywho, nitrogen, oxygen, your top two. All right, you definitely want to remember that. These other percentages are just sort of an FYI kind of thing. Water vapor, only from zero to three percent. You, you, you can't really go over 100, right? Some of those humid days, though, boy, I'd swear we were over 3% of water in the air. I'm sure you would, too. Argon. Got to love argon. I've always said, don't know what the heck argon's doing there. I, I Googled it once or twice. Until one day, we were looking at windows to buy, and I noticed that uh, they were putting argon in between the panes. Gas-injected, gas-filled, I forget their wording. And they were using it as a filter. So we may have argon to thank again for some of our filtering properties from the sun's energy and so on and so forth. But just a wee bit of argon. Carbon dioxide, CO2. This is the one I told you about a little bit ago. 0.035%. And you're like, oh my God, that's what Al Gore's going on about and, and all these other people. Really? 0.035%. Who gives the rats behind if that goes? That's such a small number. Well, again, my point is that it is what Mother Nature put it at. And if you move it up or you lower it down, and we've seen evidence of this in the ice core samples and, and currently going on in the world, when you mess with this number, things change very quickly. When we look at ice during the time of the ice ages, we see that CO2 levels are very, very low. And as we go through those cores to when we're leaving the ice ages, we see that the CO2 levels go up. She does all this naturally without us doing anything. But once we learn how to harness the power of fossil fuels, we are throwing out way more CO2 into an already existing cycle. You follow? So we already know that CO2 regulates ice, or lack thereof in this case. So we're throwing fuel on that fire and then wondering why it's, it's happening. So again, to the folks that 
know this stuff, who, 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 who you know, understand this stuff, there is no question. There should be no confusion. One of these, you know, you, you so tell one of your friends or a, a parent, sorry, a family member, you know, why are we even having this argument? We know, blah, 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 blah. It's, it's exactly like that. But not everybody understands this. So we continue to have this argument. So it's a teeny tiny number, but it matters. It is that number for a reason. All right, and other at any rate. Let's all move on here. Other, 0.065%. Other is a whole bunch of stuff. All right. Uh, one of everybody's favorite that falls under other is nitrous, nitrous oxide. Okay. Uh, it's a naturally occurring gas. So if you're uh, wake up and you're having a particularly happy day, maybe the nitrous oxide levels in your area are a little higher than than usual. Because again, every little bit matters. If CO2 matters, that matters too. All right, so number one gas is nitrogen by far. Number two gas is oxygen. Learn it, live it, love it. All right? All right, when we come back, we're going to talk about more stuff, but different.